Thank you. To present our first inductee, Steve Flink, with the honor of Hall of Fame membership, I introduce this woman who just so happened to win 150 singles titles, seven French, six US Opens. She's a broadcaster. She's a lot more than just that. She's a dear friend of tennis all around the world. Please welcome Hall of Famer Chris Everett. Thank you. First of all, I can't believe we used to play tennis in this heat. I, we should get a medal for that, aside from all this. Um, first of all, I'd just like to congratulate uh, all the other inductees, Monique and Vic up in heaven, um, Kim, Andy, one of our greatest American champions. Uh, this day belongs to you. Enjoy it. Um, I'd like to tell you a little story, um, not a little story, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about my friend Steve Flink and explain why I believe it's fitting that he is being inducted today into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. I've known Steve since he interviewed me at the 1973 French Open. That was a long time ago. He was just getting started as a reporter back then, and his interview with me in Paris was his first published piece. Uh, he did it the day that I reached my first Grand Slam final. And I honestly, I cannot tell a lie, I don't remember meeting the guy, but he reminded me of this. <laughs> um, so in a sense, we started our careers together. He has earned the respect of both the players and his fellow writers for not only the high quality of his writing, but also his great passion for the game. He has the ability to astutely analyze tennis matches and provide fair and insightful articles. He knows tennis the way very, very few people know. Steve has been involved in the game in so many ways. In 1974, just to give you a few of his stats, he went to work for World Tennis Magazine. From 1992 until 2007, Steve wrote for nearly every issue of Tennis Week magazine. Since 2007, he has been a great weekly columnist for the Tennis Channel website. Steve Flink is a tennis historian following in the footsteps of the great Bud Collins. He has made his own legacy. In 1999, Steve wrote an excellent book called The Greatest Tennis Matches of the 20th Century. There really is a treat, if you haven't read it, to go back and revisit the greatest matches ever, from Bill Tilden, Suzanne Langland, and to Rafa and Roger. He brought these matches alive with his enthusiasm and, and understanding of the historical impact of those clashes. He also did television commentary for ESPN in the 80s and the 90s. Steve really did a good job on air, except when he was critical of my weak second serve. I would give him a hard time about it and be very annoyed. Steve would often be at my press conferences, and it was not uncommon for him to interrupt and correct me when I had not described something accurately in my record. Um, when I did not know one of my stats, and, and trust me when I say that, that, that was very frequent, my eyes always darted right to him. His instant recall of matches over a long period of time was much, much better than my own. I remember a press conference at Wimbledon when I was asked one question after another about my career. Steve must have jumped in at least a dozen times to stop me and set the record straight. It got to a point where I was almost afraid to open my mouth. <laughs> I, like many in the tennis world, have valued my friendship with Steve over the years. Actually, we've been friends for 44 years. Tennis was different back then. These days, with all the agents and the formality between players and reporters, it would be almost impossible for this kind of a journalist-player friendship to develop. But when Steve and I started with our careers, the same barriers between journalists and players did not exist. So Steve Flink is being inducted today for a lifetime of making tennis the center of his world. He has a wonderful wife, Frances, who, thank God, was never suspicious and always patient when I called in the middle of the night or all hours of the day asking for advice on my tennis columns or my commentating. Thank you, Frances, for being understanding. You kind of had to like me from the start, I guess. His two children, Jonathan and, and Amanda, and his father, Stanley, are here today to share this honor with him. This guy, he may look like Clark Kent, but his journalism and passion for the game is Superman-like. I've never met a more humble man with such integrity. He has really earned this honor, and I am so honored and privileged to be here today to welcome him into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Steve.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'd like to just let you know at the outset that I plan to follow what I think are the essential three Bs of speech making. Be brief, be bright, be gone. Now, I, I must thank Chrissy for her eloquent remarks. You know, she was an exemplary champion, celebrated for her willpower, her unwavering concentration, impeccable ball control, but Chrissy's memory of what she accomplished was, as she just acknowledged, a little bit clouded. And, and I think it was incumbent upon me to interrupt on a regular basis to just set the record straight whenever she fielded questions about her career. Someone had to clarify those facts, it was up to me. Now, the reason I think that her memory was clouded was that she was a champion focused on the future. She didn't dwell on her achievements, how many titles she'd won, when she last played a particular opponent, or any individual accomplishment. But that was understandable. I was the historian, but she was a great player, and she knew what her prior priorities were, and that was to always think of the next major. But I do appreciate very much the mutual respect we've always had for each other, and I thank her for coming today. Now, I would not be at this podium right now without the unflagging support of four men who took me graciously under their wings. Three of these individuals, Herbert Warren Wynn, Ted Tinling, and Jack Kramer, are no longer with us, although I'm convinced that they are here in spirit today. Wynn was this nation's preeminent golf writer, but we became close, close friends when he covered the US Open tennis every year, and he was my biggest booster. Tinling was ubiquitous, a renowned dress designer and later chief of protocol at the Grand Slam events. Down through the vast corridors of time, Ted was an unimpeachable tutor for me and for many others. I met Kramer in 1972 when I was working as a statistician at CBS, and he was a commentator. He, in my view, was the man of the 20th century because of his multifaceted and far-reaching roles in tennis. And Jack told me frequently, kid, I like your thinking a lot. I'll help you any way I can. And did he ever help much more than he ever knew? The same is true of my old friend Tony Trabert, the former Hall of Fame president, champion player, and Davis Cup captain, whom I've known for more than 40 years. Now I'd like to just salute a couple of, of my fiercely steadfast allies through the years. This country's most multifaceted uh, sports writer, Scott Price of Sports Illustrated, and the distinguished Brad Faulkner, formerly of the Tennis Channel. They have often believed in me more than I believed in myself, and I can say that very sincerely. Just by hanging around Price over the last couple of decades at the majors, my stock rose in my trade significantly. Scott has been my modern day Herbert Warren Wynn. These towering individuals did everything, everything they could to enlarge my reputation. But I've had someone in my corner for all 65 years of my life who used his profound communicative skills to give me the best possible chance to succeed. My 93-year-old father, Stanley Flink, has been with me every single step of the way. Yes, give him a nice round of applause. And let me add, I, I, I made a bit of a mistake right there. Let me call him 93 years young. But I would not have landed here without his guidance. He was an outstanding journalist and broadcaster working for Time and Life and writing on luminaries, including Marilyn Monroe, who once said that he was the nicest reporter she ever knew. He interviewed Hode and Roosevelt for the Today Show, covered Kennedy and Nixon on the campaign trail, and played doubles with none other than Bill Tilden in California less than a week after that legend, before that legendary American died back in 1953. My gregarious father introduced me to Pancho Gonzalez, Stan Smith, Dick Sabbath, Billy Talbert, and many others. And in 1969, he brought me around to the press room at Wimbledon to meet a man who would become an indispensable mentor and colleague throughout my career, the renowned Bud Collins. I very seldom get the chance to publicly praise my father for the vital role he, he played in, in enhancing my career, but I very happily do so right now. <laughs> Meanwhile, my wife Frances, son Jonathan, and daughter Amanda have been pillars by my side as I pursued this tennis obsession. 
I married Frances in 1979, and she's been my Hall of Famer. Now a gifted artist, she's masterfully organized, arranging our family life immaculately. Jonathan has admirably gone into the EMT field. Ten years ago here in Newport, when Pete Sampras was inducted, I asked him to urge Jonathan to stop driving me bonkers by going for second serve aces. Sampras looked at my son sternly and said, give the other guy a chance to miss. Pete then nodded at me, thinking he'd succeeded. I asked my impish son later if he would change his audacious ways after listening to a champion he revered like no other. Jonathan said, not a chance. <laughs> As for my daughter Amanda, now about to attend graduate school in France, she told me recently with characteristic sensitivity that she's envious I found a passion in tennis that has carried me with undiminished professional joy across more than four decades. Amanda would become exasperated as a kid when I would shout at the, at the players and offer advice from my living room while watching sporting events on television. Dad, she would say, don't you understand? They can't hear you. <laughs> what I do understand is the magnitude of this honor. Only nine people have previously been inducted here, at least partially because they were writers. I learned immeasurably from many of them. John Barrett was a critical advisor. I joined forces alongside the erudite David Gray on daily sketches for the Wimbledon program and worked for the redoubtable Gladys Hellman at World Tennis and Gene Scott at Tennis Week, who both wrote penetrating editorials for year, years on end, imploring the game's movers and shakers to think out of the box. I've been one fortunate fellow witnessing the evolution of this sport from the mid-60s all the way up to today, from Rod Laver to Rafa Nadal, from Billie Jean King to Serena Williams, from wood rackets to the current frames. Tennis is the ultimate test of character in sports that puts a premium not only on physical durability, but also mental toughness and emotional equilibrium. In essence, it is a contact sport. My old friend John Roberts, the stylish former tennis, cor tennis correspondent for The Independent in London, told me recently, Steve, you have loved tennis longer than you can remember. You've expressed this passion through writing and broadcasting about the great and not so great at the major tournaments. Now here you are among the illustrious of the sport on an occasion that is one of the highlights of your life, receiving an honor which for you, in all humility, is like winning a Grand Slam championship. Roberts got to the heart of my feelings without assessment. I'm a journalist first and foremost, but a part of me remains fundamentally and unabashedly a tennis fan. I stand here today immensely humbled exhilarated and gratified by this ineffable accolade. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>